Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thanks to all of you, including Brad, Kevin Morgan, Paul Thiessen, and Mark Eller. On this episode of DTNS, Amazon's going to sell you Apple TV+. Plus. Rob wonders why posting reels on threads is the next new big feature. And we talked to Justin Robert Young about how people get political news from TikTok without following any political news people. Maybe it's the Electoral College Dance Challenge. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, October 10th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. From deep in the heart of Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Jen. Oh, my friends, it's Thursday. And uh, if you listen to Good Day Internet, you already heard me say this. Happy birthday in advance, Sarah Lane. She's got a birthday coming up this weekend. Happy birthday. Yeah, so we flipped Happy some things birthday. around. Happy birthday. Yeah. She's got time off. I'm here with Justin, Rob, and Roger. It's good, good times. It's a party. Good times. It's a party. We got good stuff coming up, too. Uh, so let's get right to it. Let's start with the quick hits. Intel's Arrow Lake desktop processors will arrive on October 24th. It's Intel's first desktop chip to integrate the neural processing unit. They do it with mobile and laptop chips, but this is the first one to have the desktop chip integrate to the MPU. Also, the GPU has up to twice the performance of the previous desktop generation. And overall, compared to Raptor Lake, Intel says the new chip should use up to 40% less power and run around 13 degrees Celsius cooler during game loads. Prices range from 294 bucks for the Core Ultra 5 245KF up to $589 for the flagship. That's the Core Ultra 9 285K. Intel also announced that its Core Ultra H and HX series, which are for gaming laptops, should arrive in Q1 2025, and we're probably going to hear more about that at CES. ByteDance, the folks who own TikTok, have launched their Ola Friends earbuds in China for $170. The buds use ByteDance's generative voice assistant Daobao, and Daobao app has 47 million monthly active users, making it the most popular generative chatbot app in China. The earbuds come from the Ola Dance company ByteDance acquired earlier this year. Pre-orders are open now, shipping October 17th. We've talked before about using radio wave detection to sense motion without having to put a camera on somebody. Threshold Care is now selling motion Wi-Fi sensing plugs that can monitor people for healthcare reasons, particularly is how it's being marketed, without having to stream video of them. So the plugs go into the electric outlets, they monitor Wi-Fi interference, and if you move about the Wi-Fi radio waves bounce off you in a way that it can tell somebody's up, somebody's moving about. That way you can say, oh, looks like grandma or grandpa are, are up this morning, or you could tell if somebody gets up in the middle of the night. Uh, they don't act as smart plugs. These are just pass-through, uh, which is unusual, uh, but maybe that keeps the price down. The plugs are available in a three-pack for $59.99. Blizzard veteran Chris Sigety's Secret Door has released details about his upcoming mobile game, Sunder Fork. It's a turn-based tactical RPG that you can play on a phone. It's by all accounts easy to set up for co-op. Kevin Purdy compares setup to Jackbox. It's meant to offer the experience of a tabletop game with friends using your phones as a controller and connected to one main screen everyone can see. The game is due out in 2025 for PC, Xbox, PlayStation, and Switch. It's being published by former Blizzard CEO Mike Moore. Hames, Dream Haven. That kind of sounds fun. I think that I sounds want, awesome. It actually yeah. does. I think I want to try that. Good, oh, good yeah. call, Chris Sigety. A uh, malicious attacker has compromised the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine, leaving a JavaScript pop-up to prove they had done it. Troy Hunt's Have I Been Owned database, which helps users track if their information has appeared in a breach, said that the database contents from the Internet Archive were confirmed to be real and uh, were now shared publicly, including 31 million records. Those records have email address, screen name, the timestamp of the last time the password was changed, and the bcrypt hashed passwords. So salted and hashed passwords. They're not plain text, but they're there when quantum computers come and they can crack, crack them someday. Uh, there's some other internal data apparently as well. The most recent entry was September 28th, so not that long ago. Then... Wednesday and Thursday, the Internet Archive suffered a denial-of-service attack that was claimed to be done by a group advocating for Palestinian rights. The same group has taken credit for previous denial-of-service attacks against other organizations like the UAE Bank and also previously against the Internet Archive back in May. 
That group claims its attack against the archive.org is happening because it, quote, belongs to the USA. It is not believed that the denial of service attack is being conducted by the same people who executed the data breach. Those appear to be separate things. Amazon announced it is going to sell Apple TV Plus, you know, the TV service, as an add-on to its Amazon Prime service. Uh, if you didn't realize this, Amazon has more than 100 add-on channels. So you can add stars and shutter and all kinds of things. Uh, some of them pretty big services. Max from Warner Brothers Discovery, Paramount Plus, and now apparently Apple TV Plus. Uh, in fact, Netflix, Disney Plus, and Peacock are the three biggest streaming platforms that are not available as an add-on to Prime Video. Uh, I think this is another move in the continuing development of platforms that want to make it easy for you to manage your subscriptions. Everybody complains there's too many subscriptions. I got to pay too many different bills. Uh, so cable TV companies have been starting to say, hey, we'll give you streaming subscriptions if you subscribe to cable. One price. You don't have to manage a bunch of stuff. Uh, Amazon is one of the people who've been a platform saying, yeah, you can get a lot of different subscriptions here, and then you just have one bill to Amazon, one place to manage them. Uh, it is interesting to see Apple TV Plus become an add-on to Amazon because Apple TV Plus is a platform that you can add on subscriptions to, including Paramount Plus. So I don't know that you'll be able to do that and nest them that way, but it would be very confusing and interesting if you could. Uh, <laughs> never, nevertheless, uh, Justin and Rob, uh, this is Apple definitely continuing to try to sell Apple TV Plus rather than using Apple TV Plus to sell other things, right? I feel like they're all coming from me. I am a serial churner, and I will cancel a service at the drop of the hat. But the more they get bundled together, the harder that becomes. Mm -hmm. So from that standpoint, it's smart. It's also smart because Apple TV Plus, you know, as far as streaming services go, it's, it's not really that big. It's, you know, not a lot of, you know, a lot of people, you know, partake of it. The shows are really good. But when you look at the subscriptions compared to other services, they just don't have that many subscribers. So if, it, if it's a play for them to truly be in this field and, and truly be a streaming service, it kind of makes sense to go to where people are signing up for services. Yeah. It's also the end of the era of hardware specific streaming services, which seemed to be especially the move for Amazon and Apple back in the day. Amazon, obviously the leading e-commerce website, they are selling their own hardware. There are they are at the bottom of the market, and Amazon Fire Stick is very, very effective. They want you to buy several of them to put in all your televisions, and therefore they would offer this content along with it. Oh, Lord of the Rings and NFL football and everything in between. Apple, similarly, higher part of the market. They want you to buy a very sleek device that has the Apple feel to it. You're able to cast it from your iPhone, but these are prestige shows. Oh, we have all the big stars. Tom Hanks has a robot dog or something. Now they're both realizing we just need to put this wherever we want if we want to take the idea of being a streaming service seriously. And it's an end of an era, but... Obviously, everybody's looking to figure out what the future is going to be, and uh, uh, it looks like they both want to commoditize their product a little bit more. Rob, I will point out, with this versus the cable model, you could still turn things on and off that are add-ons, although you wouldn't want to turn off Prime Video because then you lose all your add-ons. So I get that what you're saying. It does make it a little more complicated. Yeah, it's, it's an extra step because yeah. one of the reasons why I do it, it's, it's relatively easy to cancel these services individually. Yeah. But if I've got to go and I got to go into Prime and I got to look at which 19 of these 104 things do I want to cancel today? Well, you it just makes it a little bit more. Of them <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't. Okay. I, okay. I, I, I don't. Uh, because I'm holding out. I'm trying to have them each bill me individually. I know that some yeah. people are saying, well, that's what we don't want. I do want that because I see it. It's like, wait a minute. I haven't watched this in 30 days. You're gone. Whereas if it's all coming through one bill, I'm not looking at the, you know, I, I'm not looking at an itemized line item thing yeah. from Prime to say, oh, I'm subscribed to this and I didn't watch, or subscribed to this and I do watch. So for me, a serial churner, this makes it a little bit more difficult. But I understand absolutely why they're but doing that, that it. But that means like you're just going to stay like off me. this. You're just going to stay off this. You're you're just you're just going to make the deal directly with each, yeah, with just, each service. And, and in this case, it, it's really not a big deal because it's not like you're getting a discount. It's the same price yeah. to sign up for Apple TV Plus with Apple. 
grapple or with crime. So for me, it makes no sense to absolutely, uh, you know, to, to make any changes. You're making uh, Apple TV Plus more money by going directly because the premise here is they're, they're going to share some of this revenue with Amazon in exchange for possibly having more subscribers. Right. So they'll, they'll end up making more money. They'll just make less per user. How funny would it be if Apple's like, oh, gross, you actually take a cut? Like that's that's oh she's greedy much <laughs> protesting yeah. that the uh, the cut yeah. Amazon oh, takes this time. Uh, I mean I'm just <laughs> listing it. What do you really do? Can I uh, let me say something about Apple TV? Apple TV Plus has been joked about in Hollywood as simply being an excuse for Apple executives to go to the Emmys and Oscars. They do these gigantic television shows with top talent. Some of them are good. Some of them aren't watched at all. They have these huge you know, science fiction series like Foundation, and they don't really care. No one really, you, you don't hear because Apple TV underperformed in terms of subscribers that like, oh, the Apple TV heads really, heads are gonna roll because the sub numbers aren't there. They don't care. A a Apple, the Apple TV Plus is a, a rounding error to what Apple makes on a regular basis. But it is interesting to see them take this element of services more seriously. And Tom, you were mentioning that is just a larger trend for Apple. Yeah, they, they have been pivoting to services for about 10 years now. It's a slow motion pivot. Uh, but this is a significant step. they used to be awful step. at it. They used yeah. to stink at it. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. iCloud in its earliest days was just, just a Whoa. wreck. Uh, and I still think... I still were, would have considered Apple TV Plus to be a loss leader for services, right? Because what they really want to sell you is the bundle, the Apple One bundle that gives you Apple Music, iCloud, Apple TV Plus. And I think Apple has, saw, has seen Apple TV Plus as being a way to get you into that larger bundle where iCloud and Apple Music are probably the biggest, most valuable parts of that. You know, maybe you're into Apple Fitness, maybe you're not, but they want to get you to bundle it all together. They don't care about individual Apple TV Plus subscribers, or at least they didn't until they pull this move. This move says, we want to get people into Apple TV Plus, and then maybe that's a way to get them into the wider ecosystem of other services as well, possibly sell them so hardware. But yeah, it is one of the most definitive signals that Apple has moved on to definitely prioritizing services over hardware. It's interesting to see. Well, folks, Meta is adding more features to Threads. The company is testing out a new feature that would allow users to post IG Reels directly to post in Threads. App researcher Alessandro Paluzzi found a new option in the Threads Compose box that will allow you to pick Reels from your account and insert them directly in Threads. Users aren't really sure what the angle is here with Meta <laughs> for this feature. I'm one of those users. It's already pretty easy to post Reels to Threads as it is, and this doesn't really help with the engagement bait issue Meta acknowledged that they're going to correct uh, earlier this week. So, you know, I, I'm I'm just, I, I don't know what's going on with threads. I, I am one of the people who moved over from threads, you know, from X. I really like the service, uh, you know, a lot, but there are some holes. It is, it is not a replacement for X or for Twitter, for folks who go back that far. So I'm just, I'm just wondering what, what you know, and just to make, you know, I, I know that you have, you know, felt some kind of way about Thread since it's come out. You know, is is this one of the things that is going to allow or just going to get more people like you to want to use it, putting reels in threads when Meta itself already is able to put reels in Instagram, which is where most people view them? I guess they do it in in Facebook as well. But I'm, I'm just not certain that I understand what this particular strategy is when there's so many little things that it seems like threads could fix that would make their users very, very happy. Audio listeners, I want you to please just Google shocked Pikachu face, which is what I've been making while Rob has been doing that excellent job of recapping this story, because obviously I am shocked, shocked, friends, that Threads has no core audience and is desperately searching for any level of engagement. I have been down on this product from the very beginning, mostly because, I, and I am a, a X user, I don't know if X is worth copying. <laughs> I don't know if X is something that is w without a dedicated reason for it. Uh, uh, and we will get to why I think Substack has a good reason to do it. But for, for X, writing is not the point of either. Well, it's not the point of Instagram. And to tie it to it and not make it its own thing and try to establish its own culture has always been a head scratcher to me. This seems like just a way that the numbers on reels can go up, which makes people want to publish reels more. 
Uh, I have no idea how the number of people that watch my reels get them, but I would imagine that at least a portion of it is because it filters out to other platforms like Facebook, which drives that number up. So I don't know. It, it, it's It's always been a product that to me didn't have a central core thrust. There was no gigantic reason why to do it except for in the moment that it was born, Elon Musk had bought Twitter and everybody was mad about it. Quote, unquote, the internet, everybody, which is like the royal we. The internet, everybody is <laughs> 13 people you follow. Yeah. D did did threads let you post video before this? Yeah, you could. So you could just you, post a raw video. So it's not just you could reels put as a fancy reels easily. You could very easily put reels on here. So I, I guess this is going to make it a little easier because now when you're yeah. actually in the threads compose box, you can click a button that will open up all your reels from Instagram. Yeah, yeah. But okay. what most people would do is that if I want to put a reel on 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 Threads, I'll just go to the reel and then share it, it with just, Threads, yeah. and it's and, and then it's just there. So it's it's um, not just a fancy way of adding video. It is specifically saying we want you to be able to take your Threads and put them on Reels the way you can take your Instagram posts of any kind and they can cross post to Threads. I I agree with y'all. This is not the killer feature that everybody was waiting for, but they are definitely tying threads and Instagram together. And I could see them saying, well, this is an easy one to add. And there's a few people who want it. Let's do it. Right. Just because it's the feature that came out doesn't necessarily mean they even think it's the most important feature. It's just one they could they could knock off the checklist. What, look, threads and Instagram aren't tied together. It's the reason why threads exists. It's the reason why anybody is on threads to begin with. If it weren't for the fact that it were tied next to it, then it would not it would cease to be. The product isn't good enough to stand alone and they know it. Yeah. And like where folks from like I'm an early adopter, I've been using this thing since day one and I do absolutely enjoy using the platform. But there are things, for example, if I am on threads and I'm having a conversation with someone and I want to DM them, I don't want to have to go to Instagram. If you look at my Instagram, there's two posts there over the last 13 years. I don't use Instagram. So why would I have to go to Instagram just to have a conversation with someone? So if 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 Meta truly is interested in, well, these things are tied together. It's really easy to bring reels over. Why don't you bring over the other stuff that probably would be really easy as well? Like DMs. Give me the ability to DM directly in the interface. Give me DM, the ability. DM is a moderation overhead. That's why they're dragging their feet on that because they, they yeah. want to make sure that they have got their fraud and abuse and, and all of that stuff in there. Because as soon as you allow DMs, you get people complaining about DMs. Because that, that's, yeah. that's head count. And that's head count. And they don't want yeah. to, they no, don't want to assign head count when it's a product that nobody cares about. Sorry, Rob. Yeah. To, see, to hear people complain this much makes me think it's popular. Because really this is the level of like, who's, why won't Twitter give me an edit feature yeah. kind of complaining. When's the last time you looked at threads, Justin? When I accidentally hit the box on Instagram and I get taken into threads because I have fat fingers. So here's what it is for me. I tend to use social media platforms for being social. So I actually have conversations. There are internet friends that I have made on threads or have maintained from X over two threads. So for me, I, I, I log into the system a couple times every single day. I post something on there almost every single day. So I am a user, and, and there are hundreds of thousands of us. There Actually, there are millions of us who are using the platform every day. I would just hope that Meta will actually get to the point where they start making it easier for us because it's not like I'm saying, oh, I'm going to go jump to Blue Sky or Mastodon or something like that. But a lot of people are just because they're not giving the moderation tools, they're not giving DMs, they're, they're not doing the things that a social media network that has as many users as Threads has generally has. And that's that that to me is where the problem with Threads so... is. It's like it's big and they don't have big platform features yet. Me, I, tell I me honestly, your least favorite thing about engagement bait posted to <laughs> threads. I, I, I honestly just don't know why they didn't just build out a more robust text only thing that they could just flow into Instagram and just make it a platform. Isn't that just what expand. they did? Just well, no, but they had to silo it into this other thing and call it a fake other product, which it's not a, another product because it's it's tied it to is. Instagram. The 
The Honestly, only when reason I'm using threads, sometimes it, I realize I'm using X. And I, I get the two confused, for good or ill. I think that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. The, the, the reason Meta built this on top of Instagram is because they knew that they were going to immediately have 100 million people using it. Of course. Yeah. Um, yes. They're yeah. going to have to go and through the growing pain. It's a that's, separate that's product That's the now. reason. That's why. But you made that decision. Now make the platform not suck because you have hundreds of millions of people on it. Make do you think it, it sucks? Seem, it doesn't suck. It just okay. doesn't uh -huh. do the things that I would expect a platform. It is not as good as X. It, it's it, not there it yet. Isn't. It yeah. isn't. It is no, not as true. good as Facebook. It just it just isn't. You know, I mean, you know, you say it's what you want to say about Facebook, but it's not as good as that. So that it's not as good as Blue Sky. So Jaiku in the mud. I don't, know. Do. I don't know about that one. That's that that's debatable. It has more people, but the the feature but set. Blue Sky is more feature set. Yeah, yes. okay. I'll buy that. Yeah. Shout out to Blue Ski. Uh, we didn't mention Reddit, folks. Sometimes you just escape from it all and you go to Reddit. Uh, if you would like to tell us what to talk about on the show, we have a subreddit. I used to say go to dailytechnewsshow to reddit.com, but I don't think that works anymore. So just go to reddit.com slash r slash dailytechnewsshow or just find the link in our show notes. It'll take you there. There have been reports that a lot of people get news from TikTok. Interestingly, a report from Pew Research this week finds that less than 1% of U.S. TikTok users actually follow politicians, civic actors, or traditional media outlets and journalists. Most of these people do follow entertainment, pop culture, humor, and of course, viral dance clips. So I don't think that is surprising. But how does it explain that 45% of U.S. TikTok users report seeing at least some content about politics? One explanation could be that maybe they're getting their content from the entertainment posters who mix in the political and the news content. Uh, the other is, of course, the algorithmic For You tab, which shows content from creators you may not follow, but TikTok thinks you're interested in. Maybe TikTok is forcing the news on people. Uh, I think depending on which one this is, it, it, it colors your view on, on what TikTok does. Justin, where do you fall? I don't get as much politics stuff as I want. Well, I want to odd. <laughs> I want I want to be surfaced old clips of Walter Mondale, and I am continually <laughs> left without it uh, on on my for you page. This doesn't surprise me at all. I think it's reflective of the larger trend of what people actually want. In fact, one of the things that is uh, happening currently in our modern uh, American election, as it rounds into its final month for, for president, Senate, and the House is that undecided voters that are not plugged into politics are very, very hard to find. And it's because mainstream sources have become very politically driven. News, by and large, is something that covers politics at a, while, a way larger scale than it would uh, in, in past decades. And so if TikTok is the kind of place where you escape because you don't want to watch CNN, you don't want to watch Fox News, you don't want to read the newspaper, you don't want to do these other things that have a politically driven bent to it, then it does not surprise me in the least that when you're on this vacation, you don't want to do any work. But people see it. Is that Well, is people that see bad? it because people see it, I think, now, and I wonder what the, the time frame of this survey is. Uh, people see it now because it's hard for anybody in the world to not get some flicker of the American presidential election. It is the biggest news story in the world right now, just because of the outsized influence that American politics has. So this is the I would time add when to that world events such as Israel, Ukraine. Yes. Of you know, which, of which of, all of this which has, ties into all of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Everything is ratcheted up right now. And especially in the cohort that pays attention to TikTok the most, these are very, very salient issues. Uh, and, and also what is political is blending. You know, our modern politics is very culture savvy and you know, there, there's, there's no, uh, it's not a surprise when Kamala Harris became the democratic nominee, they were, her campaign itself were tying her to Charlie XCX and Chapel Roan, the hottest music acts of the moment, because the the gap between what used to be the grown ups doing grown up stuff and the kids doing kids stuff, and maybe the, the 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 two meet every once in a while, is now far closer together. And TikTok is an example of that blending. When when I was reading through this article, I thought it's like you know what that it seems like I see 
a fair amount of political stuff on TikTok. And then I thought about it. It's like, wait a minute. Am I actually a TikTok user? Mm. I do, I've never posted a single thing to TikTok. Mm. And I had to think about it. If I have a TikTok account, I can't remember what the username and password is for it. Because I would say that 99% of the stuff that I see on TikTok, I don't actually see it on TikTok. I see it shared somewhere else. And I just, I'm just watching it via a web a, a website. And I think That's the things that are being shared are coming from other social media platforms where maybe politics does play a little bit more. So that's why I may be over indexed in the amount of politics that I see when I absolutely realize that I am paying attention to something is on that is on TikTok. Um, and I wonder if that's how a lot of people are seeing it. They're saying that they are TikTok users, but are they really? Are they just seeing a lot of TikTok every day as compared to being someone who is logging into the application and looking at things that uh, you know is you know coming to their feed every day? I, I don't know what the answer to that question is, but I wonder no, because yeah, for yeah. me, I technically am not really a TikTok user because I don't have the application installed on my phone. I cannot remember what my account is. And even though I see TikTok videos darn near daily, they're coming from someplace else that can be curated in a different way than what TikTok is actually doing. I hadn't even thought about that. That's a fascinating aspect of that. Um, and to answer your question, Justin, the 45% who say they saw some political news uh, was from a Pew Research Center survey March 18th through the 24th of this year. Okay, so that's so within primary, the, pri yeah, primary, within the primary season. season. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Makes sense. Uh, I, do, I do think that a lot of this is probably, I, I think more of it than I, I would have expected is probably what Rob's talking about. Uh, and, and maybe that's a, a, a prime mover here. I also know that my wife uh, uses TikTok. She posts to TikTok a lot. She, there's a community she's involved in there. And that community will often start talking not just about the thing they're talking about. They're here to talk about music, right? Uh, but they also start talking about what's going on in Gaza, what's going on in Ukraine. Like that that will bubble in there because they're, you know, there's no rules. They can talk about whatever they want. I think that is part of this too. Um I don't know how much is for you. I know the tinfoil hat would be like, oh, TikTok's pushing an agenda and showing you news it wants you to see. I don't ever see news in the for you section of TikTok because I never use TikTok for that. So I'm not I'm not sure it's that. I think it's probably more endemic or, or what Rob's talking about would be my guess. All right, before we get out of here, let's check out the mailbag regarding our discussion of Notebook LM on GDI Wednesday. Philip writes... I think what's most profound about it is that it may be the best demonstration of generative entertainment yet. There have been plenty of AI sites that generate audio and video shows from scratch, like InVideo or LTX Studio, but they are always really bad, very cheesy, full of randomness. But this deep dive podcast from Google generates such an amazingly realistic and genuinely entertaining show, it's unprecedented. It feels truly intelligent in a way that most of the current AI does not. Once they start offering more malleable versions of this technology, we're going to see, and I can't wait to make, really wonderful and ridiculous shows popping up. Viva la deep dive, says Philip. <laughs> Which, by the way, I immediately trained at Notebook LM on his post and mm -hmm. then sent that back to him. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. That's actually pretty interesting. We've also got another one uh, here, another mailbag item from John Barger from IT Sparkcast. He writes in and says, in the September 13th episode of IT Sparkcast, we discussed a newly discovered attack vector, RAM RF radiation. RAM is so fast these days and draws so much power that with the right equipment, the hacker can read the contents of RAM remotely. This will require a device in the same room as the target computer, but could be as small as a Raspberry Pi with a specialized hat. Think Darren Kitchen's Wi-Fi pineapple. Yeah, uh, these are there's there's a lot of cool stories about this. I had not heard about the RAM one. Thank you, John, uh, for sending that along. I, I've heard of ones that that can read the fan noise changes and be able to to be able to exfiltrate data just based on the fan monitoring. These are usually not practical because they're hard to sneak into the room that's air gapped without detection, whereas a USB drive is not hard to sneak in without detection. So that's why we usually get what we talked about yesterday. But uh, yeah, be, just being able to to sense the RAM on an air gapped machine is pre pretty impressive. Thank you, John, for sending that along. And thank you, Justin Robert Young, uh, for being here. Uh, what's going on? Anything new in your world? Oh, baby. Yes. I have made the decision 
to take my talents to Substack uh, from Patreon on the Politics, Politics, Politics program. For the vast majority of you that only listen uh, on the free feed, nothing's going to change at all. But if you do want the bonus content that I put out twice weekly, then you're going to need to go to Substack instead of Patreon. Thank you to everybody who has done that already. If you were subscribed to Patreon, uh, I'm actually about right after this to post the episode that normally goes out for everybody. If you were on that feed, go ahead and get your free RSS feed from Substack. That is comped through the end of the month. And then we would ask you at some point from but between now and then, you go ahead and change your uh, payment information to the new process. Uh, it's been a dream working with Substack, and I look forward to talking more about it. Fantastic. Thanks to you, Justin. And we're going to talk more about this in GDI. But if you want a recap of the week's tech headlines with insights and in how technology affects and disaffects community of color, then check out the Tech John, where host Rob Dunwood, Stephanie Humphrey, and Terrence Gaze. I, somehow those names sound familiar to me. Um, mm-hmm. Dive into the top tech stories of the week delivered from points of view you don't always hear in mainstream media. New episodes land Tuesday afternoons. Find it wherever you get your podcast or visit the Tech John. That's the Tech J A W N dot com. You should check it out, Rob. The, the fact that the main host is especially good, I've noticed. Mm. He's, does, he's, does, he, does he have a deep voice? He does. Tell you what, does. Hell, hell, hell of a hat voice. game. Hell yeah. of a hat game I'm, on that I'm, host, yeah, too. I'm, I'm that's a, a great, sucker that's for a great guy shot. with a deep voice. Yeah. Uh, Well, as Rob mentioned, uh, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. Justin just moved his podcast, so we're going to talk to him about why did he do it? How did he do it? What did it take to do it? What were the pitfalls? What are the solutions? Uh, All of that is going to be discussed and more, so stick around for that. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. There's details about that at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow talking about backing up your data before the next natural disaster with Patrick Norton and Lynn Peralta will be here too. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>